Our text from Isaiah says this. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth from the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the hunt of, in the hunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is our text for today. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room has heard this phrase, it's my way or the highway, absolutely. And, and it's usually used by such football coaches like Bill Purcells, or if you can remember back far enough, somebody amazing like Vince Lombardi. It was used in the 1960s as a leadership model that insisted that you must do the job the way you are told or you can hit the road. Right, but today I want to turn that phrase just a little bit to change our understanding of it, to think of my way being the sinful, foolish, selfish way, and the highway being the way of God, the way that, that is of, of a holy way that leads to the reign of God, the kingdom of God, the world put right. The verse today, it, verse 8 says, And a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Now, we're not talking something like a, a four-lane interstate or, or an eight-lane interstate, but, but something more than just a mere footpath. It would be a, a construction that was built up enough that you could look at it and recognize that that was something different. This was a highway, a way that was set apart for other purposes, right? Holiness is an attribute of our God. Holiness, to be holy, is to be completely set apart, to be distinct. It's an otherness. And so this highway is like that. It is a holy way of God. It is set apart for a very distinct purpose. If you may recall, Jesus, he said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. This highway is the way. The way was also a term that was used for the first church. They were called the way. Instead of St. Luke's Lutheran Church, it was the way of Oviedo, if you will. This is the way that followers of Jesus were called. And it's interesting to note that <laughs> That the word used, Isaiah uses, is even the foolish can do this walk on the way. Because the fool, he likes to figure out, uh, which is good for us, because we often are fools in trying to live on either one side of the ditch or the other side of the ditch. And we constantly need to be brought back up onto the way. And even a fool, even a fool is brought up to the way. It's really interesting. God's standard for our lives is here, and us as foolish, selfish sinners are somewhere down here. And instead of God making his expectations for us lowered so that we might meet them, instead he takes us foolish men and women and out of his righteousness declares us to meet his standard. That's how God operates. He never reduces his standard to meet our ability. He raises our ability to meet his standard. Now, I want you to do some self-reflection today as we think about my way, the sinful, broken way, and God's way, the highway, 
the way that leads to everlasting life, I want you to think of it with reflection, the way of the wilderness or the highway to new creation. Now, because our planet is slowly turning into a wasteland. And I have to admit, I, I don't spend a lot of my days thinking about the environment, thinking about the wellness of our world, but if you think about it, Christians should be the greenest people of all. If you take away all the politics associated with that, we should be seeking to be good stewards of the land that God has entrusted to us. And yet we seem, we seem bent on destroying it with ecological disasters, Things like deforestation or the North Pacific garbage patch, which is this floating island, enormous floating island of plastic garbage, or nuclear meltdowns or the threat of nuclear war or oil leaks. And that does nothing to say about the natural disasters of volcanoes, earthquakes, hurricanes, raging fires. That's my way. But the highway, think of the beauty of nature. And think of how God seeks to recreate that. In verses 1 and 2, Isaiah says, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Now, Lebanon is, is in the north edge of Israel. It's, it's known for these amazingly huge cedar trees that God planted that point the way to him. And then you've got Carmel, this, this, this amazing majestic mountain, and, and followed by Sharon, this incredible fertile valley. And you see God saying, I am going to take all of the world, recreate it to have majesty and vitality and abundance. I want you to think for yourself, think of the most beautiful places you've ever seen. On, on the screen above, I've, I've just put a, a couple of my favorites. You can see the, the Grand Canyon, and, and, and if you've ever seen the Grand Canyon, just standing on the edge, you feel so small and insignificant at the vastness of this canyon. And then there's the Royal Gorge on, on the bottom. That Royal Gorge, I had an opportunity to raft with some friends right after college, and, and we're rafting the, the rapids, but just looking up to see the sheer rock faces and the beauty there. Or in Jasper, in Jasper Park in Alberta, Canada, you see on the top that beautiful, pristine, almost emerald lake. And of course, I'm a Kansas boy. I grew up there. And as much as I love Florida and the ocean, there's just something about seeing in, in late July or, or late June when the, when the wheat heads have just, just fully matured and they bend and they're kind of a rust color and the sunset hits it and the wind blows those amber waves of grain. Beauty. And I have to imagine that even these most amazingly beautiful pieces that God has already created will be even more abundant, even more beautiful. And the places that we now see as dull and drab will be just as gorgeous. I think we can see the glimpses of God's glory in our world today. But even these are going to be even more majestic in the day to come. And then there's this picture of water. In 6 and 7, it says, Isaiah says, For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become like a pool. And the thirsty ground springs of water in the haunt of jackals where they lie down the grass shall become reeds and rushes see water is the source of life it's a source of flourishing water came forth from the wilderness as god allowed his people wandering around to drink in the book of exodus water brings life it's through the waters of the red sea and through the waters of the Jordan River that they enter into a new life. And it's our waters of baptism that, that wash us and bring us life. We have this vision for what St. Luke's is going to look like. And it involves, it involves looking at our community and the parched spiritual condition of the community that surrounds us. And it takes a look at how that community no longer sees the church as the source for the revitalizing 
living water of Jesus Christ as the, as the, as the, the answer for their problems. And meanwhile, there's places like this room that are filled with people who, who perhaps believe that it's, it's just content to come to church, that that's what it means to be a Christian, is that you come to church for one hour a day and then you go apart and, and live your everyday life. That's called soaking in the shallows of the sanctuary and just being content with that rather than being encouraged and revitalized to dig deep and splash down deep into the waters, be soaked by the Spirit of God, and let him show you life that you never dreamed possible, that you would be springs of water that flow out into your places of work, into your schools, into your neighborhoods, into your homes. Imagine this. Imagine an entire community coming alive to the power of life in Christ. That's something that gets me so excited. That God yearns for us to see so much more. And to share so much more. All right, I, I want to turn our, our self-reflection from, from creation to our own physical bodies. Right, as we think about my way or the highway, let's talk about weakness being made strong. Isaiah talks about weak hands and feeble knees. Can any of you relate to that? And if you can't, just wait. (laughs) You will. That's what happens to our our bodies. This life, it wears us down. I, I should say the sin in our life wears us down. And that's my way, right? Life is, can be exhausting. But from a, from a resurrection world view of the world put right, how amazing will it be to have bodies that are strengthened with the vibrancy of our youth and beyond? All these aged and damaged bodies given strength and vitality. It's an amazing thing when we have the opportunity to, to do shut-in visits with people who can no longer get out of their homes and come to church. We, we bring the Lord's Supper to them, and it's so much fun to see the images and the pictures on their walls of, of who they were in their youth and in their prime. Just imagine, imagine that of who you are today. And and young people, I know this is a tough one to to wrap your head around, but one day you will be old and gray and weak and breaking and falling apart. But there will be a day where God puts you all back together, who puts you back with the strength and the vitality of a 20-year-old. Imagine that day. See, the the highway offers us an alternative to my way. How amazing will that be? I love the prophet Isaiah. One of my favorite verses in all of Scripture is Isaiah 40, verse 31. It says this, But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love that idea. Isaiah says, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame man shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. This is the, the restoration of humanity. All of our handicaps, all of our limitations, all our deformities will be reversed. We will be for the first time in our lives fully human in all that that means. Even with all our advances of medical science, we are still a long ways off from this. I promise you this, science does not offer you the solution to age, but Christ does. This is the healing that I love to talk about in funeral sermons. The healing of the total, full restoration of health when our resurrected bodies see Jesus face to face. The joy that that will be, no more cancer, no more memory loss, no more dementia, no more arthritis, no more COVID, no more death, no more mental health issues. Every limiting element of sin in our lives will be taken away and made right. What an enormous, liberating experience this will be. And moving from our bodies, let's think about our head and our heart for a moment. That my way or the highway, my way of anxiety traded for the highway of joy. What causes you to be weary or anxious or doubtful or fearful? Maybe work or difficult relations, relationships or, or medical issues or, or mental problems. Even the Christian walk can be wearisome. 
You can get tired of doing good all the time, being the person who stands up for, for what is, is right and good, to stand up for those who need help. It can, it can wear you down. This is, this is my way of anxiety and fear, but the highway is knowing this promise that our God will come to save. Isaiah says this, Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with a vengeance, with a recompense of God. He will come to save you. And I want you to know this, this act of God coming to save you has already started. Right? Jesus has already come. That's what we celebrate when we remember Christmas, the birth of Jesus. That event of Jesus has started. The birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, ascension, and promised return. That's what we wait for. That's what we yearn for. And that's what we long for. This event is already in motion. He has come and is in the current act of saving you. We just have the final act to go. Our God will come again to save us for eternity. See, anxiety robs us of peace. But faith in the promise of God to return one day, it removes anxiety. We're granted courage through his word. We have this hope, this true hope, not a a, I hope this happens, but I have hope in the promise that this has already started and will finally come to completion. Our God will come again to save you, to save you from sin. The people who walk on this way are those who are redeemed, people who have been purchased back from sin, death, and the power of the devil, redeemed, made a child, a son and daughter of God Most High. That is you. That is me. Not because we've elevated our behavior to the point of excellence so that he loves us, but he loves us. And out of his mercy declares us to be who we're supposed to be. On this highway, the redeemed have nothing to fear. In verse 10, he says, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is maybe one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible. Let me read it one more time. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, sorrow and sighing, flee away. This is that moment where we enter into the kingdom of heaven in all of its fullness, in all of its glory, with whole and perfect resurrected bodies leaping for joy at the life that we now live with him. And when we hang on to the anticipation of that, The modern current problems of this world, they fade away. They don't go away. But they become so less important to the joy and the hope and the treasure that we are striving for, that we have already in Christ, just not in full. And to to, to wrap up our our message today, I want to go back to the very beginning of this text because it, it mentions this word, a crocus. And I love the picture of the crocus that you see on our screen above. The crocus is not a very common flower in Florida. In fact, I don't think it exists in Florida. Uh, Maybe somebody from Lucas Nursery could teach me otherwise, but I don't believe it does because the crocus needs about, about four months of really, really cold weather. It's a bulb flower. It comes from a bulb underground, and it needs about four months of temperature under 40 degrees, which does not happen here, in order to bloom properly. And when it does bloom, it's not like the most spectacular of all flowers. It's not the largest. It's not the most colorful. It's pretty small and diminutive. It only comes in a small number of colors. But it's a powerful flower. Because it's a flower that, while it may not be significant in what it looks like, it is extraordinarily significant in what it symbolizes. Because you see, the crocus is the very first flower of spring. Those of you who are up north know the horror and the chill of winter and the longing and the yearning that sometimes reaches into May or June that you're just like, come on, God, bring on the sun, bring on the warm. And through the surface of the ice, through the surface of the snow, pokes up these humble little purple or yellow or pink or white flowers. 
that announced that this horrible winter season is drawing to a close and a new season of spring and summer that follows after that is on its way. You see, the whole idea of this highway is that we are on a journey together and you can't be on a journey and be stagnant. You can't just stay in place and say, I'm on a journey. Highways are meant for journeys. So if you are on the way, if you are on the highway, the holy way of God, then the intention is you are moving. You are moving in a direction. You are growing. You are developing. You are allowing God through the power of the Holy Spirit to grow you in discipleship, to become people who live transformed lives of freedom, of joy, of sacrifice, and renewal. One step in front of the other. It's not a race. It's a marathon. But keep moving. How is God moving you this year? What are areas of life that he yearns for you to grow in? to continue walking this amazing, amazing highway of God and enjoy the scenery as you do. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you so much for being a God who who lifts us up to the standards you've set for us. Father, we pray that you would embolden us and encourage us to take steps continually on this highway, growing more and more into the men and women that you would have us become Fill our hearts with joy. Remove all anxiety. Replace it with joy. Father, for the the aches and pains of this life, we long for the, the total restoration that comes in the kingdom to come. Give us minds that focus on that glory as we work through the issues of this world today. We pray all this in Jesus' powerful and holy name. Amen.